A few Detroiters had the unique opportunity to travel across the country covering Nelson Mandela. We have two of those journalists here tonight. Detroit Free Press columnist Susan Watson and WDIV reporter and anchorman Emory King. Welcome to the show and welcome. You're an old friend and a part of the show, Susan. Thank Let you. me go to you first, in fact. I was uh, at the Ford plant covering that aspect of Nelson Mandela when he was in Detroit and I remember how I felt when we were watching the monitor and he was just arriving at the airport and people were cheering and clapping and I was reminded of the column that you wrote about a tear or crying from one eye and I know that's the way that I felt. I mean I was a reporter and I was supposed to be there and covering it objectively but there was just such excitement and you know I wanted to clap and cheer first and I had to kind of hold myself back and say you know no I'm working. Did you get that feeling throughout the trip? Yeah, I did. There was um, I was lucky because I was doing a column, so I didn't have to to be as objective as 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 you or you or anyone else. And uh, but still, always inside of you, you want to say I want to be fair, I want to be objective, and all that good stuff. But I remember you mentioned it when he. I wanted to be in New York when he touched down on American uh, USA soil. It was just symbolically important to me, a, a uniting of, of Africa and America. And I was there, and we got there real early. And when he put his foot down, I, it's true, I was crying. Tears were coming down out of one side of my face, and they were tears of joy and tears of sorrow and tears of pain and, and, and just these, these the whole maelstrom of emotions. And, uh, and the other side was dry because I had to take notes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, be cool. Well, Once a reporter, <laughs> always a reporter. Emery, when, when was your moment? When did you get that feeling? I cried several times mm -hmm. on this trip. I got uh, in my you're eye. crying now. Yeah, that's because I saw in my eye, though. But go ahead. Uh, <laughs> We, we picked up Nelson Mandela in Toronto, and so that was the first time I saw him. And uh, he came out on, on the stage in this park in the afternoon, and I didn't cry that time, and I, but I stopped. I remember stopping, and, and my thought processes stopped and as far as the story and covering the story was concerned, and I just looked at this man and took him in for about five minutes. Um, at that point, I was able to go on as a journalist and do my job, and, and the emotion of Nelson Mandela didn't hit me there. It didn't hit me until New York mm -hmm. at Yankee Stadium for the first rally. And when I had a chance after we had done our live reports to go in and sit in the stadium and just kind of sit among the people and listen to people and talk to people and watch this crowd come in. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then when Nelson Mandela came out, and, um, and I, I remember very specifically when he first said, my brothers and sisters, it just welled up. Yeah. And, it, mm -hmm. and, and I, I, I get choked up thinking about it. For some reason, that touched my nerve, and it just came out. And so there, there were a couple of other times along the trip when, uh -huh. when my emotions got the better of me. Any difference between the Canadian and the American audience? No, the Canadians were a bit more reserved, mm -hmm. as they tend to be, I think. Um, um, but, but he generates such excitement after, you know, when the crowd got there, they were a little reserved, but as he talked, they warmed up to him. They sure. were just as excited as everybody else was everywhere mm -hmm. else on the trip. Okay, let's kind of travel across the country, and we have okay. a few clips from some of the cities, so let's start in New York and take a look at that clip, and we can kind of react to that and then travel okay. around the country. One of the first stops on the South African Leaders Tour was perhaps America's best-known black community, Harlem. Here's a part of his speech in that New York enclave. The kinship that the ANC feels for the people of Harlem goes deeper than skin's color. It is the kinship of our shared historical experience and the kinship of the solidarity of the victims of blind prejudice and hatred. To our people, Harlem symbolizes strength and beauty in resistance. I have fought against white domination and will fight against black domination. I have cherished an ideal for a democratic society in which all persons will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an idea which I am prepared to live for and achieve. But if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. 
that struck me, Susan, right off the bat, in that he set the stage right there in New York. Um, you know, this is nothing that mm -hmm. I'm playing around with. I am prepared to die for this. Is that what you got out of New York? Yeah, and I think I think he made it very clear there. A lot of us had this this vision. Some of us, I think, had this vision of, of Nelson Mandela as being this old avuncular person. I mean, he's 72. He's been in jail forever, um, and we just heard about him from from behind the prison walls. And and I think people kind of viewed him as just this nice guy coming mm -hmm. to visit who's done some neat things, mm -hmm. but he's old. Yeah. Well, the brother got here. And the brother made it real clear that he may laugh and joke, but he don't play, That's right. as, as we say. And that he was deadly serious about his mission, and he did not waver for it. He was focused, <coughs> he was on target, and he was not going to yield. And uh, had a strength of character, moral, moral fiber, that just made you feel good to be an African. I, I think what's particularly interesting about that that cut, which was in Harlem, mm -hmm. at the Harlem rally, right. um, was that he was quoting there from the statement he made when he went at to prison. At the treason trial. At the treason uh -huh. trial. Mm -hmm. uh, and that really kind of underscores that unwavering spirit that yes. he had through all of yes. those years in prison, that he hasn't changed one bit mm -hmm. from that from that moment. Mm -hmm. and, and so it was particularly symbolic and meaningful that mm -hmm. he would come to Harlem and say that. Which they called the, which uh, uh, Winnie Mandela called the the Soweto of the United States. Yeah. Really, that, yes. night. Yeah. that was fitting. The other thing is that just he did not show rancor or anger or hatred or spite or malice, mm -hmm. and that amazed me yeah, because I got all that time angry, in jail. Yeah. and he just he he did not have time for those emotions. I think probably a, a moment that many people will remember, of course, will be the town meeting in New York that was on Nightline. Were you surprised that? actually the reaction after the initial reaction to his remarks about Gaddafi and about Castro, that that, that didn't continue, that there wasn't more of an anti-groundswell. I mean, people were upset initially, but certainly he was still received with open arms as he traveled across the country. I'm not sure I, I understand your question. In terms of the reaction to his, his strong support of Gaddafi mm -hmm, and Castro, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously I don't think that that was going to affect many black Americans' opinion of him, but I thought that there might have been a little bit more backlash from some of the other groups as he's toured the country. Well, I, you know, I, I think he so effectively handled that question mm -hmm. that there wasn't anywhere to go with it uh -huh. um, on the Nightline program. Uh, I, I, he, I think he made it very clear. Uh, and and although they, the, his critics may have wanted that to remain an issue, I think Nelson Mandela himself diffused it. Yeah. That's the way I saw yeah. it. Uh -huh. He was a man who has uh, been out of been out of pocket, as it were, for twenty some odd years, and is almost made for television. I don't mean to trivialize it, but he handled himself so well. He so knew how to get to the issues. He but knew look, how to he do left Koppel speechless. That, that paralyzed was the, line was classic. I think <laughs> after people have forgotten about the the. Um, remarks about Libya and Cuba, people will remember the fact that this is the person who left Koppel speechless. That's what I heard right. from city to city to mm -hmm. city to city to city. And what happens, I think, after that much time in prison, when you have so much time to collect your thoughts, uh, you become very focused mm -hmm. yes. in what you believe, yes. yeah. and you know what you, you 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 know how to express yourself. You mm -hmm. know how to articulate your thoughts and your ideas, and so uh, it was it was very interesting and amusing to see him just cut through all of the oh, fat, yeah. straight to the point, yeah. Yeah. and not and not be deterred in, in what he yeah. believed. So unlike most public figures yeah. that we see on TV these yeah. days. That's right. Let's move on to Boston and talk about that after we first look at this role in. Mandela was also very warmly received in Boston by perhaps the most integrated audience of his trip. It was also one of the few times when Min Winnie Mandela spoke publicly. It was you who supported us when very few knew of our existence our trial and tribulations. It was you who rallied around our cause at a time when we soldiered on, on all by ourselves. And thus you became the conscience of American society. You have no idea how lucky you are that you have reached this stage in our history. We are here as your umbilical cord. We are here to remind you 
that liberating South Africa is liberating you. We are here to remind you that you will never be free until we are free. Amanda! Amanda! Viva la ANC! Viva! We're still having a good time here. I mean, this is an example of 72 years young. I mean, everybody's like, look at Mandela. Yeah. He was partying and having a good time. You can't sit still and just watch that. But that really was a serious time for you, too, Emery. That, you said, is when you that, really uh, lost it. Uh, I did lose. That was the best time. That was the singular, uh, my singular favorite moment of, uh -huh. that, of that trip. I, uh, that's when I really got, the emotion really got to me. If I can just share my personal sure. experience with you. We had, uh, we had completed our report, 6 o'clock report. That was on a Saturday, I believe mm -hmm. it was. And so I was really kind of down and through for a while, and we were leaving Boston that night going on to the next stop. And so I took off my microphone and my headphone, and I had a chance again to step aside one uh -huh. of those moments and just watch it. And at that point, this music kicks up, and I'd see the 72-year-old man yeah. up here dancing. And then before, and so, and so I got caught up in it with everyone else. I looked up on the platform, and Liz Walker, who's an anchor woman for WBZ TV in Boston, who was in the middle of her <laughs> broadcast, <laughs> apparently, got up and was doing the same thing. Uh, but we talk about objectivity in reporting. I, I think, uh, kind of in defense of that, uh, apartheid is something that you as a journalist can safely be against. Sure. It's you, indefensible. It's, yeah. it's indefensible. Mm -hmm. um, to see someone uh, uh, go through his experience and come out a winner, undeterred, yeah. is a cause for celebration. Objectivity has Indeed. nothing to do with that. And I think that was the, that's what that celebration was mm -hmm. about by that crowd in the Esplanade. Yeah, yeah. yeah it was well, a good moment. It was, it was wonderful. The other thing is that it was so clear that Boston was like home. New York and Washington were taking care of business, but Boston was like, I'm uh -huh. home, I can take right. off my shoes, you, my, you've my been children with us are since here. The beginning. That's true. Yeah, Winnie, I feel thank comfortable the audience with the for taking Kennedys. care of her children, I think. Yeah, and it was just, uh, there, was a, there was a rapport there, an ease there that you didn't see anyplace else. I mean, Boston was home. Uh huh. Right. Well, what about winning? We didn't really hear from her that much during the tour. Do you think that that was intentional because we saw so much of her before Mandela was released? Or why do you think that was? I think it was intentional. Um, she was having a hard time at home before Mandela was released. As you know, there's the whole issue over the, uh, the death of, right. of the young man by, by some of her, her bodyguards of the soccer team. She'd made some statements that had gotten her in trouble, and a lot of people were saying, Winnie, chill, Winnie, we're going to have to cut you loose, Winnie, whatever. Um, in many ways, she came to America, took a back seat to her husband, and, and was reborn, um, got a new sense of, of validity. Um, uh, probably here and, and probably over there. As Nelson Mandela mentioned, there were uh, a lot, of, well he didn't mention this, but the fact that there seemed to be more whites in that audience and that Boston was one of the early cities that supported um, divestiture and things like that from way back. Did you see a different type of mix of people or a different feeling in Boston from other cities? It was predominantly mm -hmm. uh, a white audience. Obviously Matt. Boston's a predominantly white city too, but still. Um, but there were, the other rallies I, I noticed, mostly black people, but uh, yeah, it was a predominantly white audience. Uh, Boston, of course, had been experiencing its own racial problems. I remember listening to the radio in the hotel room that morning before the rally, one of the call-in talk shows. And there were a lot of critical Mandela calls, a lot of calls, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. critical of his visit. But uh, not that crowd that afternoon. Mm -hmm. there, that was, it was a, mostly a young crowd, I yeah. think, as yeah. I remember. Mm -hmm. um, 
but no animosity. Everybody was happy. I mean, everybody had a good time. Mm -hmm. Boston so. also, excuse me, marked sure. the first time that he veered away from his, I'm not going to talk about your problems, I'm not going to inject myself in your problems, I've got my own problems to worry about. When he went to a high school in Roxbury, predominantly black crowd, mm -hmm. before he got to the Esplanade, he told the youngsters, you got to stay in school, you got to study, you got to do these things. In New York, correct me if I'm mistaken, he had said, we need your help for our children in South Africa. We mm. need money. We need books. Right. They're going, so do we. But he gave advice to the actual In Boston, American he children. made the turn and started getting involved uh -huh. in, in American affairs, and that mm, was in that high point. school. Okay, let's move on to Washington, and I know that's a city that you've spent a good amount of time mm. in, Emory, because before coming to Detroit, mm -hmm. you were an NBC correspondent. Uh, is it unusual to see another leader stand up to the president like that? I mean, he even mentioned that Bush is misinformed, and that's why I'm here to, to kind of straighten him out, so to speak. What was the feeling like Very in Washington? Very unusual. Very unusual. The, uh, the, the Washington establishment, I think, was, again, taken aback as they were with Ted Koppel, with his reaction to Ted Koppel, that this man just cut through all <laughs> of the... You know what? Sure. And went straight to the mm -hmm. point again, even uh, standing there on the south lawn of the White House with uh, President uh, Bush. And it was very interesting to see President Bush stand there and read his formal statement. And, and then when it's, it came time for Mr. Mandela, he had no written statement. He just stepped up to the microphone and, and he said what was on his mind and, and just really kind of chopped President Bush's statement apart. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, people were quite taken aback. And I think the president was surprised. He was heard to say on a microphone afterwards, he turned to Mandela and he said, nice speech, no notes. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you so, yeah, that? right. So, I, yeah, yeah, he was surprised. Washington was significant because that was the city that he came to to take care of business. Sure. Mm -hmm. and so the public uh, appearances were cut to a minimum, and it was about business and about the, the uh, business of putting the pressure on President Bush mm -hmm. and his administration and Congress to get the much needed funds and political support for the struggle mm -hmm. back uh, mm -hmm. in South Africa. Okay. Did, did you see much of Washington and all that? Yeah, I did. I, I, um, I saw him at the White House with the president, and I, I, I again just had to stifle a giggle. I didn't even stifle a giggle <laughs> <laughs> when, he, when he made his um, presentation. Um, I saw him at the United Nations, uh, not on the floor, but in a separate room with United Nations employees. And so there was just a lot of cheering and applause for him. Um, I think um, the boxer perhaps got the first round of applause. Mike, Mike Tyson. Tyson. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, right. that ripple mm -hmm. went through the room first, but uh, that was... Okay. It, you know, it, was all, it was also interesting to see all of these people, well-known celebrities mm -hmm. like Mike Tyson mm -hmm. and Robert De Niro and over somebody else. coming out, you know, <laughs> yeah. like, like, uh, 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 like normal, regular people, sure. everyday people getting off their jobs for a chance to see see this man. I mm -hmm. mean, I remember the ticker tape parade in New York. You saw people yeah. mm -hmm. hanging out of windows, uh, yeah. janitors, yeah. people, you know, to see this man. Yeah. Uh -huh. Incredible. What about the aspect of the problems that Washington's going mm -hmm. through right now with the Marion Berry situation mm -hmm. and things like that? Was it kind of an interesting contrast? Lisa, yeah. to give him a moment, a moment's break from all of that? Actually, he seemed to, they made an effort to keep Marion Barry's problems away from, from him. Mrs. Barry appeared at a church with uh, Mrs. Mandela. Um, and uh, so there really was an effort not to inject the Marion Barry stuff into the Mandela stuff, and I think that was wise. The interesting thing, though, also, Washington was a place where finally African-American journalists from around the country got to sit down hmm. with Mr. Mandela at a uh -huh. press conference. They tried to do it in New York, and it was canceled. Mm -hmm. And he has this, this disarming effect on folks. Um, people were just stuttering. I mean, grown <laughs> men would stand up and try to ask questions, and they would couldn't just turn to out. jelly, and they just couldn't get it out. Right. It was a, an amazing, an amazing kind of a thing to watch. Marion uh, Barry did show up at the uh, rally yeah. that uh, night in yeah. Washington unexpectedly uh, and quietly. was photographed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as quietly as Marion Barry could yes. show up <laughs> in the circumstances. Yeah. Yeah. So let's move on to Atlanta. It seems like there would be a lot of symbolism there with that being somewhat of the heart of the civil rights movement here in America exactly. and, and the uh, home of Martin Luther King. What was that feeling like? Uh, laying the wreath at the uh, tomb of Martin Luther King. Uh, of course, uh, Coretta Scott King, Andrew Young, uh, uh, Dr. Joseph Lowry. Mm -hmm. It was a very symbolic visit, uh, very meaningful mm -hmm. to uh, the civil rights movement, to the, the people of Atlanta and the South. Um, um, I, guess of, I guess of all the stops, that was the, the least um, 
frenetic mm -hmm. from a standpoint of having to cover it and from the standpoint of a story. I just, just remember going to Atlanta and event. kind of doing those symbolic stories at the mm -hmm. main event. The wreath laying was what we wanted to do mm -hmm, from a sure. picture standpoint. And, uh, and prepare for Detroit. Our minds by that point oh, yeah, were on yeah, Detroit because to get we knew we Detroit. had some long, serious hours to put in. Sure, sure. Well, what do you remember about Atlanta? I remember standing in the hot sun for five <laughs> hours waiting to get into a church. I can't remember the name of it. Mm -hmm. But in each city... Big Bethel. Big Bethel, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes, Big Bethel. In each city, there was a host committee, and the host committee worked with the with the State Department, whoever, to set up plans, and it differed every place you went. So if you got credentials for one place, you didn't have them for the next place, you might not have them for the next hour. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to be in Big Bethel, and so I sure. got there three, four, five hours early, because you simply had to, mm -hmm. standing in the sun, and then being told I couldn't get in, and then sneaking <laughs> around a back way, and... Uh, is that That's a time when he dealt with the similarities between the civil rights movement here and the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa, or it just he was in and out of Big there? Bethel so quickly uh -huh. Uh -huh. that um, he didn't deal with much at all? It was one of those those many stops he made that were just very quick, where he apologized, said, "Don't take this personally, but, but I have to go." He also told mm -hmm. the children in Roxbury that uh -huh. the black children mm -hmm. in Roxbury, That's "I have good. to leave, but don't take this personally. Yes. They're not doing this to you because you're black." Right. They're doing it to everybody. Mm -hmm. Speaking of mini stops, let's move on to Miami, which certainly was a mini stop. He really just went there to, to have one speech, and we've got some, some footage from there. When Nelson Mandela went to Miami to speak to the convention of the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, there were no greetings from city officials. That's because Mandela angered many Cuban Americans with his remarks of support for Fidel Castro. Here are some sights and sounds from that visit, which drew strong reactions from both sides. They should have, you know, try to have made it a bigger deal. It's very sad that we can't go beyond that. It's been a terrible disappointment to us to not see a terrific grand welcome. I truly believe that it is racism, not political. We're not against Mandela uh, freeing his country, but we are against anyone who supports Fidel. <laughs> Wherever we have been, the message has been clear. The message has been one. Apartheid must go, and it must go now. Now, neither one of you, of course, went to Miami because it was the same day as Detroit, and I know you wanted to be here. But, Emory, you mentioned that you did talk to people that were there. Right. When we got to uh, Detroit, we began our live coverage mm -hmm. after uh, the Mandela plane landed. Claude Matthews, was a producer, the pool producer on the plane, got off, and we grabbed him for an interview, as well as Harry Belafonte. Claude said uh, that he saw there was a machine gun presence in Miami, and he gave the mm -hmm. sense that, my that it was a very tense situation there. Mm -hmm. It certainly looked like it was. <laughs> yeah, it did. Later, yeah. Harry Belafonte played it down. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't that tense. It was a few demonstrators, and, and that was it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, just, I think the Mandela, the, the African National Congress people handled this very, very well. Um, they took control of everything. They handled this trip. They, yeah. they made all of the decisions. There, there was no uh, mm -hmm. American influence mm -hmm. or anything. Mm -hmm. And, and uh -huh. whatever happened in Miami, I can't mm -hmm. say I wasn't there. Yeah. They, they, they diffused it or handled yeah. it very well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They were so smart. Right. They were, you would think that they had been doing political campaigns mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. years and years and years. They were just so good. Okay, let's move on into Detroit. What do you remember about Detroit? What stands out in your mind? I remember, I remember getting uh, um, punked by two little boys at Steve's. Soul food? I, Steve's Soul Food uh -huh. Restaurant, where I had gone. Everyone else was going someplace to the, the factory and things, and I just wanted to get out in the city. And these little boys told me they had not eaten. <laughs> they had ridden their bike <laughs> over to Steve's, and I go, what do you mean you haven't eaten? And after all this stuff, I says, well, okay. No, they asked for some money at first, and I said, I won't give you money, but I'll buy you food. I ended up buying them food and 
cobbler and all this stuff. And those Is that representative, that again, of, of, of the feeling, though, that was going on in Detroit, that probably there was so much goodwill that anybody could have gotten away with anything because everybody was I just think, feeling good about uh, each I other? I think that's probably part of it. You felt a, a bonding, a, a, sure. a kinship. Mm -hmm. And that's what I was doing, trying to stay away from him and just doing the rest of the community, what folks were talking about. Right. As mm -hmm. I mentioned before, I was at the Ford plant, and I remember just what you mentioned earlier, Emery, that he kept apologizing, or maybe Susan mentioned this, uh, you know, for not being able to spend mm -hmm. a lot of time Susan, at the Ford right. plant yeah, and, yeah. you know, don't take it personally, and it's just right. that, you know, my schedule. And, but still, I don't know if it's because we waited there for so long. I mean, you could really feel the anticipation in the air. It was There was just so much enthusiasm and so much excitement there that, so what, that he was mm -hmm. only there for five minutes. You know, those people will remember yeah. that for a lifetime. Sure. Sure. Did, were you at Tiger Stadium or, or all over? What, what stays at, with you about Detroit? I was at the uh, airport for his arrival, which was interesting to see. Uh, and I was at Tiger Stadium, and what stays with me about Detroit was the uh, it well, was the choir and the music, uh -huh. for one thing. And uh, I, of, of all of the rallies outside of the one in Boston where I got carried away, uh -huh. uh, I think Detroit was the best rally. And I didn't go to Los Angeles and Oakland like yeah. you did, Susan. But, yeah. but up until that point, Detroit had the best rally. There was, there was emotion. The, the, uh, uh, the music set the tone. I thought his speech was by far uh, mm -hmm. the best mm -hmm. that he delivered uh, to, to hear this man quoting uh, Marvin Gaye, what's going yeah. on. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, again, you know, um, an emotional experience and uh, a pulling together, like Susan pointed mm -hmm. out. People just pulled together and there was for that moment or those moments here, love, I think, mm -hmm. expressed in that stadium and in the city. Yeah. Were you at Tiger Stadium? Yeah, yeah, I was and it was the same thing. Um, the amazing thing was to watch him from city to city, rally to rally. He was like the Pied Piper of adrenaline. Mm -hmm. I mean, he just went from city to city, and, and people were just enthused, enthralled, excited. And, and, and we, I never tired of watching it. Mm -hmm. You know, you do things over and over again, oh, yeah, another mm -hmm. rally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not this one. Yeah. Every time you got the, the goosebumps yeah. and the excitement. The one downside about Detroit, of course, was the supposed uh, infighting, you know, long-term African supporters like Congressman mm -hmm. Crockett and uh, Dr. Wright, you know, not being invited to certain things. Just uh, what politics is all about, or is that something that seems like could have been avoided? Well, it could have been avoided, obviously. Yeah. It's also the nature of politics. I think that if we learn anything, one, one, many things we can learn. One thing we learned from Mr. Mandela's trip is, is that uh, we have so many problems to face, confront outside that we really don't need to waste our energy in fighting. In fighting, mm -hmm. uh, we just don't have time for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because we all, they're all good soldiers. So if you had to pick a place, I mean, you know, no bias, uh, Boston, or what would be the the best spot in, or the best location on the tour in terms of the effect of the people, the warmth. Which oh. spots out of all the places that you went? I'm not sure I could, Trudy. I don't mean to cop out on mm -hmm. you. Uh, uh, New York was symbolic because it was his first stop, his first uh, a step on American soil. It was my first experience at a ticker tape parade up okay. uh, Broadway in New York. So. Uh, that certainly stands out in my mind, as well as the rally at Yankee Stadium, Boston, we've talked about. Um, and Detroit was particularly significant mm -hmm. because it's home and because, sure. you know, that, that rally was so meaningful. Um, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I really couldn't. I, I just have to, uh, in retrospect, take in the whole visit and, and uh, call on my emotions and what it meant to mm -hmm. them. We're into our last minute, Susan. Uh, you did go to the West Coast. Yes. Any closing thoughts on that and closing thoughts on the tour well. in general? On the West Coast, he reaffirmed the fact that he is indeed in control and, and uh, he knows what he's doing. In Oakland, he announced to the surprise of everyone, including the ANC staff, <laughs> that he was going to come back if they allowed him. That's right. And meet with the uh, Native Americans because time. of their problems <laughs> in his free time. Sure. It just shocked everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so. so let's go cover that one. Overall, yeah. <laughs> anything, that, one thing that you can pick out is. Um, I think the city. one thing that I will remember is the gym in Roxbury in Boston. It was it was tight. It smelled like a gym. Had the old rickety floor. There were like Just lots of nice young folks small there. Gathering. It was small and hot, and people were excited. And when he came in, there was such excitement, and people were stomping on the bleachers that the floor started to shake, and it really did feel uh, the, the earth really did move, mm. uh -huh. and it was tight, so the sounds were reverberating back and forth, and it was the closest. Great. Well, that's. Our, Already we're out of time, but I think that the earth definitely moved for all of us, so let's hope that we can keep that spirit going. Thanks again for joining Thank me this you. evening.